Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to be talking about uh, some spooky file systems. So obligatory, before we get started, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I am the founder of a company called Superorbital, and we provide Kubernetes uh, engineering services and also Kubernetes workshops, uh, kind of actually all different types of cloud native workshops. We do things like Terraform, we do Docker, and we have actually a workshop that's called Containers Demystified, and that's actually where this content comes from. We just took one of the uh, chapters from our workshop and we're giving it to you now, so uh, I hope you enjoy it. In a previous life, I was the uh, I ran engineering for Cloud Foundry, which is um, <laughs> kind of almost no longer exists, but it was a competitor to Kubernetes. Um, but much more interesting in a much more previous life, I had my hand on the big red button of Southern California. I actually ran the Southern Californian earthquake detection system, uh, <laughs> which was a whole lot of uh, duct tape and uh, rubber bands holding that thing together. So. Uh, if we get a chance later, we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to say real quick here, by the way, uh, I asked Sally to be very proactive in uh, giving you the microphone. So if you have any questions, I'm used to constant interruptions. With an audience this big, it's a little bit more difficult. But if you just wave your hand to Sally, get a hold of her in the chat, then she can give you the microphone. You can just yell out whatever question you have. I'm not going to be focusing too much on the chat because I want to be able to uh, get through this presentation with you, right? All right, so let's talk about what we're going to learn. We're going to learn about the variety of file systems that you can use in, in Linux. And we're not talking about the physical file systems. We're not talking about uh, XFS and all those different file systems that you can use to store your data. We're talking about the spooky file systems, right? And we're going to give kind of a uh, an overall understanding of what each of these file systems do. And we're going to uh, go a little bit into details, but obviously we've got 25 minutes, so we're not going to be able to go as deep as maybe we would like. We'll do our best. All right. But first, before we even talk about these various file systems, for some of you who might be coming to uh, Linux a little bit fresh, uh, we want to talk about what mounts are in general. So first of all, computers have disks, right? and disks have file systems. That's how we organize the data on the disk. And Linux was the first operating system to combine all of the mounted disks, or all the disks that are physically attached to your computer into a single virtual file system. So before Linux, uh, you had like, for example, uh, DOS and Windows would actually just have different uh, drive letters for each one of the disks that are attached to your physical computer. But Linux took this and said, well, actually, we can make this a lot simpler for, from a usability point of view. And we can mount all of those into a single virtual file system. So here you can see we've got slash, we've got slash user and slash dev, and then we've got a mount point slash home that it is actually on a completely separate disk. And then we've got mount floppy that is also mounted into there. Now I keep using the term mount, and that's what we call it when you graft a new physical disk into the global file system, right? So here I uh, create a directory slash user slash local, and then I mount dev sda2 into user local as a file system type ext4. And then when I list the mounts, I can actually see that file system there. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, there's something wrong with the slides. Sorry about that. Now you can also list the mount points using the newer find mount command. So if you're old school like I am, you haven't gotten used to the new commands, uh, you might still be running just mounts, but you can also use find mount, which is uh, prints it in a nice little tree. It's much easier to understand. It's pretty cool. Now most mounts are normal disks like we were just talking about, but in Linux, um, eh, for the most part, everything is a file. If you're more interested in this, uh, look into like uh, plan nine to really understand the everything is a file metaphor. However, uh, some mounts because of this are actually spooky. So one of the things that we can do here, uh, if, you, if you remember in uh, your containerized, containerization history, you probably run unshared double dash pid double dash mount proc, right? And you might have wondered, why did I have to use that flag mount proc? 
Well, when we unshare into a PID namespace, we, it's not good enough just to have the, the, the PID namespace available to us because all of the Linux utilities actually use the slash proc mount point. Slash proc is a virtual file system that provides information about all of the running processes. And you can get more information about proc using man5 proc. If we look on your running system, you would see that you've got a proc file system, uh, a proc mount point there. And if you look inside the proc mount point, you would see directories for all of the PIDs of the running processes in your system. And so that's why when we do unshare into a new PID namespace, we also need to have unshare mount proc for us, because if we don't, then commands like ls just, or sorry, commands like ps just won't work. So here I'm in a shell and I'm getting the PID of my shell and I can see it's 40345. And if I look in slash proc slash 40345, I can see a whole bunch of files, a whole bunch of very useful files. Um, I can see the C group that I'm in. I can see the command line of the command uh, of, the, of the bash shell. I can uh, access the root directory for that shell. Uh, or sorry, the, the current working directory for that shell. And I can even get access to the environment variables for that process. And if I look at the strings for command line, I can see that it's running bash. So again, if we enter in a new PID namespace with the old proc file system mounted, then the world looks just entirely incorrect. So here we're just entering a new PID namespace, we're forking, um, we're echoing the uh, PID. We can see that we're PID one, because remember, we're in a new process namespace, which means we are now init. Uh, I look at the strings for the command line and it says that I'm a nit, but that's actually incorrect. That's weird because I know that I'm actually bash. And what's going on is slash proc is actually the external slash proc of the parent namespace and its PID one is slash sbid slash init. So instead we need to unshare with double dash mount proc so that we see our own current version of slash proc. All right, so that was the first spooky namespace. A lot of old school people are very comfortable with slash proc, right? Slash proc is old and full of chaos. Um, it, it was the first interesting file system uh, and it became kind of the junk drawer of the uh, Linux virtual file system, right? Uh, so here you can see that we've even got like a slash proc slash CPU in info file, like what? What the hell is that doing in slash proc? That's, that has nothing to do with processes, right? That's just talking directly to the kernel. So it, they started adding more and more files to slash proc and realized that that was just getting out of hand. So they created a new file system called Sisyphus. <laughs> SysFS. It's newer than proc, excuse me. It's uh, much more organized, which is nice. And it's only used to talk to the underlying kernel. So here we can see, again, using the mount command, I can just see that there's a uh, sysfs on slash sys of type sysfs. And if I look inside that slash sys, I can see that it's got some nice directory structures. If we did a bare ls on slash proc, you would see, I mean, depending on how many processes run on your system, you'd easily see hundreds of files and directories in there. With slash sys, it's much more organized. Now, if you've ever played around with C groups, you would have seen, if you ever play around with them under the hood, creating them by hand inside the Linux kernel, you would have done so by manipulating files and directories under slash sys. All right, so that's slash sys. Basically just a new version of slash proc that's a lot more organized and it's only used for talking directly to the kernel. When you create and modify files in slash sys, you're actually talking directly to the kernel and changing its behavior. For example, with the C group stuff, we're creating and managing C groups. There's also slash dev. Now, slash dev didn't used to be a special file system. Slash dev just used to be a directory that you would create uh, device files in. But now, slash dev is actually backed by dev tempfs, which is a special file system which automatically creates its own device files based upon the hardware the kernel uh, can find on the system. So again, remember in Linux, eh, for the most part, everything is a file. And that actually includes things like your keyboard or the disks or whatever. In fact, we've seen when we were mounting things that we were mounting slash dev slash SDA1, for example. 
Now, here I'm looking at mount dash V and I can see that we have dev tempfs mounted. If I look in slash dev, then I can see that we've got uh, SDA1, we've got standard air, standard in, standard out. We've also got the TTYs, which are your terminals. If you read and write to a device file inside slash dev, you're actually writing to the device it represents. So here I'm echoing hi to standard error just by typing it into dev standard error, redirecting it to dev standard error. Obviously, you don't want to do this with slash dev slash SDA1. You know what? Screw that. I, I encourage you to do that. Um, just don't come to me afterwards, right? Now, some files in slash dev are actually completely virtual devices. So here I'm grabbing 25 characters from slash dev slash random, which asks the kernel for some completely random data, and then it prints it out to the screen for us. All right. The next one is tempfs. So tempfs is a file system that only exists in RAM. It's never written to any disk, but it does allow us to create arbitrary files and data and so on. Tempfs is used all over the place. I mean, it's, it's prolific and especially useful in things like containers and Kubernetes uh, for uh, things like uh, security and speed, right? So here, I've got, uh, I'm mounting a 10 meg tempfs under slash secrets. And this way I'm, I'm sure that uh, no matter what happens, if somebody steals my computer, they're not gonna be able to do forensics on the hard drive and get at those secrets. If the computer reboots, if the container is restarted, the secrets are all gone. So this is part of your healthy, nutritious diet in secrets management. All right. Next, we have OverlayFS. OverlayFS is one of the first ones that gets pretty hard to understand. So let's take this one a little bit slower and, uh, and really dig into how the details work. I'm also gonna pause just to see, Sally, have there been any questions that you wanna bring up at this point? There has been a lot of lively discussion. Um, Great to <laughs> hear. You're bringing back a lot of great memories. Um, I don't see any specific questions just yet. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> with overlay S, it's a very interesting file system. What it does is it combines files from a read only lower layer directory and a writable upper directory. And it presents both those combined as an overlay directory. And that overlay is the mount that you want to expose to people. Hey, a question came in. Wonderful. <laughs> um, does unshare dash dash mount proc have a new mount namespace? Yes, very good question. For those of you, we're gonna get into mount namespaces in a second, but if you do uh, unshare double dash mount dash proc, it will do a bunch of things for you, including move you into a new mount namespace and then also mount a new proc FS into your mount table. Great question, thank you. All right, so OverlayFS is, is a very useful uh, file system and the client who you pointed at the overlay directory, they just see a normal directory. From their point of view, they just see files in that directory. Um, anything that's, uh, any directories in the readable uh, lower layer and the writable um, upper layer are merged. And writing to a file first copies it from, if you're writing to an existing file in the read-only lower layer, it actually copies it into the writable upper layer. So let's play around with it. So here I'm making a few directories because you've got to have all these directories in place before you can execute your mount command. So I'm making a work directory, a lower, an upper, and an overlay. And then I'm mounting a new mount point at, at uh, dot slash overlay, so in my current directory and I'm mounting it as type overlay, and I'm setting a bunch of mount options. And the mount options are where I point the kernel at what I want to use for the lower, the upper, and the work directory. All right, so I, I execute that mount command, and now I can see, I mean, it doesn't look any different. I've got all four of those directories, they're completely empty, right? And first of all, if you're wondering about that, that work directory, it's only used for internal, uh, basically atomic writes, and we're not going to be talking about that anymore. 
Now, files and directories inside the lower and upper are visible inside overlay. So let's say I, I have slash, uh, in upper I've got bar slash above, and in lower I've got foo slash below. When I look at the overlay directory, I'm gonna see all that combined, just gets merged into, into each other. So here I've got under overlay slash bar above and foo below. And directories are merged. So if I have two directories with the same name, here I've got bar above and then foo, another above, and then in the lower directory, I've got foo below. So when I look at the overlay, I get a completely merged directory tree. Uh, I think maybe there's a question, Sally, what do we got? I was going to um, interrupt you. So um, I've used bind mounts before. What are the key differences with overlay FS? Um, bind mounts are completely different. We're actually getting to, gonna get into bind mounts next. Um, Overlay FS and bind mounts are often used together. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about how Docker makes use of this stuff. And one, uh, one more. So um, any kernel work on mounting overlay FS on overlay FS, it would be really useful to run things that mount overlay FS inside a container. <laughs> useful to run things that mounts. I'm not quite sure I understand that. Um, let's let's hold that one off until afterwards if we have extra time to dig into it. Yep. And one more. Um, what's the situation today regarding overlay versus overlay two? Uh, that I have no idea. I'm going to be honest with you. That like I haven't gone deep enough into the current kernel history to understand uh, what's the transition there. Okay, yep, and someone else added there's no such thing as overlay yeah. to it. Well, that explains it. <laughs> used by Docker to designate a way to pass multiple lower dirts. And Dan, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll. Yeah, I think I can that. actually see these here. So let's see, what happens with deletion of files? When you delete a file, it actually puts a marker file in uh, the writable upper layer, marking it as deleted, which is why deleting a file inside a Docker file uh, doesn't actually remove the contents of that file when, when it's generating the layers. Uh, and Caesar is joined to ask to clarify his question, I think. Absolutely. Uh, or maybe not. Hey, Caesar, you have a question? Uh, no, I, I guess the question that I, that, uh, that I had was uh, the overlay on overlay FS mount, just to give you a little bit of context on that. Uh, sometimes inside of a, of a container, you want to run things like Docker or even probably Podman, and they mount overlay FS, right? And mm -hmm. what you want to, the, the only way to currently do that is to, when you create the other container, bind mount uh, non overlay FS directory into the container and have the inner Docker or whatever work on that. And that's not ideal. Uh, what, you know, would be really, really useful would be to for for us to be able to mount overlay FS on top of overlay I FS. I did not realize that there was a limitation where you couldn't create an overlay overlay FS mount point yeah. inside a container. I, I yeah. assume with privileged containers it was possible, but it looks like Silvano might have answered our question that it got that yeah. was removed because of instability. Yes, and so what I'm asking is yes, is there is any kind of work to bypass that um, that instability and to actually formally. Uh, uh, support overlay FS on top of overlay FS. Uh, right. That was right. Right. Thanks. That's, that's a great question. I guess I was going to say I don't know the answer, but again, the community is stepping up, so it looks like no work currently. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And Cesar, you can hit the leave button. That will just stop you from sharing. You'll still be in the talk. Thank you. Yep. All right, so let's um, let's continue forward, just because I am a little bit worried about the amount of time we have for getting through the content. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue on. Um, so, I think somebody asked about directories with the same name. Just as we're showing here, directories are actually merged. So, we have two foo directories and they're getting merged into the overlay correctly. Now, writing, so all that is kind of a little bit more obvious. You just merge the lower and the upper and whatever, you get this overlay directory. But writing to new files inside overlay is a more interesting process because if I touch a file overlay slash hello, it actually is obviously visible in the overlay directory, but in reality, the contents of that file are put into the upper writable directory. That's what it's for, right? That's why we have that upper writable directory. And similarly, if I modify a file, if I write to an existing file, it actually copies it 
into the upper writable directory first. So if I have a file called Cthulhu in the lower directory and I modify that file through the overlay directory, it'll actually put the new version of that file in the upper directory. And if I look at both those files, the lower one is empty as it was before, and the newer one in the upper directory has the contents that we created. Now you can actually have many lower layers. You're not limited to a single lower layer. You can colon separate many different directories that are used as lower layers, and you can share lower layers amongst mounts. So here I've got, uh, three different mount points, first, second, and third, that are all three of those are overlay points, right? I've got the same shared lower directory in all three of those, and then I'm using a different writable upper layer for each of those three. So they all have the same read-only data, but when they write to their directory, they write to their own dedicated upper directory. Now, OverlayFS was originally designed for bootable, writable CD images, right? So you could have a, an ISOFS that was the uh, read-only lower layer, and you could boot from that ISOFS, have a tempfs in RAM that was also used as the upper writable layer, and then merge all that together into a big overlay so that the Linux kernel, or when, when, you're, uh, when you boot the system, all the system utilities think that they're writing to a read-write you know, normal disk. That's the original intent, but now the most common use case is Docker. So as I mentioned before, you can have many write on, or sorry, many um, read-only lower layers, which is all of the layers in your Docker image before they're uh, used by a container. And you can have a, uh, many different overlays that are all mounting the same lower layers and have their own dedicated writable layer. And that's exactly what Docker does, right? So all those layers that go into your uh, Debian image um, that are shared amongst all your different applications, uh, each one of those containers that are running against those mounted uh, images has its own writable layer that it writes to. All right, next let's talk about bind mounts. Somebody asked, what's the difference between bind mounts and overlay and how do they work together? So a bind mount is actually super simple. It just mounts the same directory in two separate places in the file system. That's all it does. So I've got two different directories, one and two, and I mount a bind mount from one to two. It's the same directory, two locations. If I create a file, if I create a file like one slash file where the content's old, I can see that that file exists in two as well. If I, um, modify the file in two, then I see the modification exists in one as well. Now the mount can actually be a, a single file as well. They do not have to be directories. So here um, I'm creating some data in a file called source and I'm creating another empty file called destination and I'm mounting source to destination. If I cat destination, I can see that it's got the data. Very important fact, these are not like copy it around. This is not to uh, a virtual file system that's pretending to be something else. From the Linux point of view, it is the exact same file. I've got the stat output here to kind of prove that fact to you. Now, uh, there's also mount propagation because we've only got about six more minutes. I'm not gonna spend any time on this, but basically uh, bind mounts get crazy if we start looking at subdirectories and you've got things like MS private, to control whether or not mount propagation happens between the bind mounts. Um, it's just something that you have to worry about when you're using bind mounts in things like pivot root, which we'll get to pretty soon. <clears throat> All right, mount namespaces are very interesting. When I first learned about mount namespaces, I assumed that it actually encapsulated data, but that's not what a mount namespace does. A mount namespace is there uh, to copy the, or to, to give you a new fresh copy of the mount table, not the data itself. So here, let's look at a couple of different terminals. On the left, I got terminal one. On the right, I got terminal two. In terminal one, I'm going to create a tempfs uh, uh, mount point at slash data. I'm going to touch a file in there. So I've got slash data slash file. I ls slash data, the file's there. Nothing weird about that. In terminal two, I enter into a new mount namespace. I unshare double dash mount and run a shell in it. So now I've, I've just changed the prompt to mount namespace to show them in a new one. 
I run mount and I can see that I've got that tempfs mounted there. If I look at slash, it looks the same as I expect before. If I look at slash data, I can still see the file. I can even modify the file. I can change the contents to hello back in terminal one outside the mount namespace, the file contents have changed, right? And I can unmount slash data um, inside terminal two, and that does not affect the mount table in the parent namespace. So that's the key to mount namespaces. It's about mount tables, not data. If the parents, uh, if the two processes in different mount namespaces uh, are both mounting the same thing, they see the same contents. So mount namespaces don't provide the file system isolation that you might expect and that might be useful for things like containers. Instead, we need chroot and pivot root. Now, first there was chroot. Chroot changes the root directory of a calling process. Um, you can use the system call here. You can also use the chroot command. So here I'm making a root file system. I'm chrooting into the root file system running bin bash. And it doesn't work because after I've changed to do an empty directory, everything in there is all that I see is the system. So if there is no bash, then there's nothing for me to run. So I get the chroot failed to run command slash bin slash bash, right? We're in a completely empty slash. So instead we have to actually prepare our rootfs. And many of you have probably heard about busybox. Busybox is designed exactly for this. It's a single binary that acts its shadows as all the other different utilities. So I use busybox to create um, a uh, rootfs and I mount into it. And now, uh, or sorry, now when I chroot into that, <clears throat> I have a minimal Linux file system. So chroot changes the root directory of the calling process uh, ish. It's not very good. It only changes the slash part of any directory passed into a system, system call, which means it's not secure, right? There's many ways to bypass chroot security. Here I'm showing how we could just get into slash proc slash one slash root. Look, we're out of the chroot, right? Now, pivot root is much more interesting. It moves the root file system of the calling process. Now, you may, uh, if, if you're really paying attention, you might have noticed that the, the sentence there and said, wait, wait, didn't he, means, didn't he mean moves the root file system for the calling process? Indeed, sir, I did not. So pivot root changes the global system root. And the reason it does this is it was designed to be used during the boot process. So when I was playing around with these utilities a long time ago, I, I couldn't understand why every time I called pivot roots, uh, my box just failed to respond to SSH connections. This is why you're actually shifting root for all of the processes in the entire namespace. So if you pivot root from new to old, uh, it sets the system root to new, moves the previous system root to old, which is why we call it pivot. Pivot root is super picky. So as we mentioned, there's like mount propagation you have to worry about, all these details about where new and old are. Um, and pivot root, like I said, is designed for a very esoteric use case and it's only recently that it got, you know, more popular use with containers. Now, if we combine mount namespaces with pivot root and chroot, then, we've get, then, then we're cooking with fire, right? So here I'm going to use unshare double dash mount pid and fork. So I'm entering a new pid namespace, new mount namespace, and I'm going to fork. So I'm isolating the changes to our mounts. I'm preparing the rootfs using busybox. I'm calling pivot root and chroot. This is okay to call now because I switched into a new mount namespace. Again, the whole purpose of the mount namespace is to isolate the mount points. So now pivot root is only going to modify root for my mount namespace. Now that I've done this whole dance, I can run mount and I can see that I only see the files that I expect to I'm isolated as though I'm inside a container. I mean, I'm basically am, although come on, what are containers, who knows? And then we're done. So as a quick summary, slash proc shows you information about all the processes, including ourselves. Slash sys is a newer version that lets us talk to the kernel. Slash dev contains device files. Tempfs is only in our memories. Overlayfs combines all the many directories into a single overlay. Bind mounts lets you mount the same thing, directory or file twice. Mount namespaces isolate your changes to the mount table 
Chiroot changes your personal slash. Pivot root changes the system slash. Thank you. Good night. Now, if any of you are interested in uh, hearing a lot more about this, like I said, this is just one chapter out of our Containers Demystified course. Um, please do tweet us, follow us, reach out. We have all these different workshops. We're actually going to be giving the uh, core Kubernetes workshop soon uh, in a public setting, so you could be part of that. Uh, now, do we have any time left? I think I'm 50 seconds over, but Sally, yeah. I'll leave it to you. We, yeah, we don't, but um, it's a good thing that you answered those questions um, in, in, during the talk. So that was amazing. So what I would recommend is for people to watch the um, recording and sort of go through it and do it on your own system, because that's, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. I can, I can hear all the applause right now. I mean, I know your mics aren't hot, but I can hear it. So thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, working with you today. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the conference. There's a lot of great talks coming up next. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.